First John four. First John four. Johnny, would you turn that little light on? Up there. First John chapter four. I don't know how far I'll get through this, but I'll start. We'll get something. How about that? Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. False prophets. The reference in verse 1 is to false prophets prophets operating under false pretense giving out a false message <coughs> and he tells us to test the spirits whether it's of God Testing requires a trial, a trying. Testing requires experiment or examination, which are designed to determine the qualities or the characteristics of someone or something. Testing. I don't know for some of us it's probably been a few days since we've taken a test. Raise your hand if it's been a while since you've taken a test. Anybody took one lately? <coughs> test. I started thinking about testing. There's a variety, from my memory, there's a variety of ways that I have witnessed testing. I can remember some tests that I took that the instructor did not want me to fail because if I failed the test, it would reflect on them poorly. So he made sure we knew the answers. Not much of a test. Testing. Not much of a, not much of a challenge to our thinking. Several ways of testing. That came from an experience I had in Econ 2. Economics too. Guy was uh, getting his internship in economics, and so he made sure we all had the answers. He didn't try us very much. All we had to do was memorize the answers, regardless of what the question was, knowing how to put it in the proper place. Testing. Several ways of testing. A lot of times when I experience testing, they would lay, lay, you would get the results of your test and then there would be a key to the test. There would be the, the correct answers on one side and then there would be your test on the other side of the page. The truth laid on one side and then my answers laid on the other side of the page and it was a, a comparison to see if I knew what was the right answer, testing. Another way to test something is to put it under a load. Put it under a 
alone. And when you have something that you're testing and it's maybe it's an engine and it runs fine at idle but when you put it under a load then you get to see whether it's in time fuel levels are right ignition levels I know very little about what I'm talking about outside of what Someone tells me. But I know enough to know that there has to be enough fire, right? There's got to be ample oxygen. There's got to be fuel if it's a combustion engine. And then when you put it under a load, <coughs> the stress is added, and then you sit back and see, is it what you thought it was? It's a test. Sometimes we take stress tests. Walter took a stress test today. I hope you didn't mind me mentioning that, Walter. If we do, we'll edit it out. <laughs> a nuclear stress test. Nuclear stress test. Because it's hard to test your heart resting. So they want to stress it to see where the issues lie. Test the spirits to see. I took a stress test one time, probably 15 years ago. I wish they'd have gave me one a year ago. They skipped it. I wish they would have skipped it. I took a stress test. I can't remember. I think they want you to walk up that hill for eight minutes. Anybody remember something like that? Man, I'm walking. They're like, get off of there. There ain't nothing wrong with you. <laughs> You ever bought a car and the check engine light was on? Those little, those little gauges or lights on the dash of your car, do you know why they're there? They're indicators. About a year ago, I was looking for a truck pickup. So my precious son-in-law found me one, drove it to my house, said, look at this. Man, it was nice. It was 2015. I think it had about 40,000 miles on it. One owner, great price. It's my son-in-law. <laughs> Left it there at the house. I went out to get in it. Started it. And it didn't start right up. Turned over a few times. Second try, turned over, but time or two, started. I called him, I said, Zach, I, I think there's something wrong with this truck. He came, took it away, beautiful truck, great price, low miles. Had them put it on a computer, test it. I believe he told me it had 7,000 misfires. 7,000 codes on the injectors. He said, Papa, you want out of this deal? I said, yes. <laughs> you know why? It failed the test. They look good. But under a load. 
It failed. Come on, boy. Yeah, I got it on. What we're supposed to be doing is testing the spirits. There's a lot of spirits in the world. There's a lot of voices in the world. You don't pass the spiritual test with just words. No. Right. Spiritual tests are passed when there's stress on in your life. And then you watch the comparison with your reaction to what the scriptures say. The word of God, if you will, if you're a school teacher, is the key to the test. Yeah. Try the spirits. Try the spirits. I was listening to a message on the sons of Eli, the priest. He had two sons, Hophi and Phineas. At the time of offering, Hophi and Phinehas, Eli's two sons, they would take the portion of the offering intended for Passover and they would eat it themselves. They also slept with women in the door of the entrance to the meetings of the temple. And as a result of these two sons that Eli the priest would not get control of, the Ark of the Covenant is taken and, taken and held captive by the Philistines. During this altercation with the Philistines, Hophni and Phinehas are killed. When the news reaches Eli, the priest, he falls over backwards and breaks his neck and dies. Now, this man had led Israel for 40 years, but he had failed the test. His daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, she heard the news. She's expecting a child and when she had heard that the altar of the covenant has been captured, she goes into labor, gives birth to a son, and as she's dying, she names the boy Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord has departed. Now you and I, we might not think that the word of the Lord is somehow it doesn't mean what it says. We might take it at times and pretend it doesn't really mean what it says. But the truth is we're going to be tested by the word. And many false prophets, John says, have gone out into the world. Verse 2. He says, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not born from God. Acknowledge, acknowledge there in those verses. Not only knowing intellectually. But it has to be, what that word means is not just mere knowing intellectually, but has to be lived out. Some versions use, use the word confess there, where acknowledge is. That's why in Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. I've thought about that scripture a lot lately. Matthew 10, 32.
when the heat was on, Peter denied the Lord. Do you know how he denied the Lord? Not simply in the cynic structure of denying the Lord. He, the Bible says he cursed and he swore. And John says, the spirit of Antichrist is, which you have heard is coming, and now even is in the world, Antichrist. Everybody, oh, at times, I say everybody, but sometimes in the religious circle, we, we talk about the Antichrist. John said Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. This was over 2,000 years ago. I don't know if I'll ever see the Antichrist, but I see the spirit of Antichrist now in the earth. Antichrist, Christ, the spirit of, pushes back against what the word of God teaches. Verse 4, John. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. How many believe that? The one who is in you, the power that is in you. I don't feel very powerful. Do you? I don't look very powerful. Do you? But John said the one that is in you, the one who lives in you, who's he referencing? Yeah, he's referencing the Lord Jesus Christ. He's referencing the Holy Ghost yeah. that is in you. Yeah. Do you believe this? Amen. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to, but I ain't going to get it. Right. The one in, who is in you is greater than the devil. The devil, he's going to try, I've already said this tonight, he's going to try to distract you from knowing this. Yep. Realizing that there is a power that's in you. Do I talk like there's a power in me that is greater than is in the world? Or do I sound like the world? Oh, Lord, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Oh, I don't know. Do you know this? You don't know. Oh, what is that? You're looking at waves? Thank you, Lord. Just looking at the waves. All kinds of distractions, all kinds of situations. He's instigating all kinds of trouble. You know the devil's a troublemaker, don't you? Raise your hand if you know that. Yeah. He wants you to get in your feelings. That's part of those waves. Anybody in here, don't raise your hand. Anybody in here ever get in your feelings? Let me tell you how I feel about that. Well, that ain't worth two cents. That's your feeling. Tell me what the word says about it. It's a test. You start telling me about your feelings, you're telling me about your pride. Well, bless God, Brother Steve. You have to be like that about it. It's what the word says. What? Get your eyes off the waves. Yeah. Come on. The devil wants you to ignore the word of God. That's right. Well, I know the word of God. I mean, at least I know a little bit of it. I've, been, I've had my pastor preach it to me and read it to me. I've heard, them, some of us have heard the word of God all our lives. The question is, when are we going to learn to believe it? Help us, Lord. Yes. Uh, 
Because we listen to some false doctrine. Yeah. Antichrist teaching. Anti-anointing preaching. Yeah. That's right. Anti-Christ messages. That's the truth. God help us. False doctrine. The viewpoint of the world. Now, uh, let's go back like I was trying to teach Sunday. Let's make sure we're reading the text in context. The context of this scripture is John is writing to a group of people called the Gnostics. The Gnostics, in that Greek term, that word means, can be tra translated as science. can also be translated into the word knowledge. The Gnostics, I'll try to summarize this. The Gnostics believed that their belief system was based upon knowledge and only those considered special, whatever that meant, in life had this special knowledge based on science. And what they're doing, they're trying to pull people away from faith in Christ, faith in the resurrection, because they're preaching a message based essentially on men's wisdom and science. So that's the context of these scriptures. John was dealing with people who think they know when they don't. So this is a bold statement. Verse 5, he says, they are from the world and therefore they speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are of God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us, and this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Listen to the word, not what's in your head. Verse 7. Now we're getting somewhere. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God, whoever does not love, does not know God, because God is love. Well, he's putting this real simple, but it's, it's, it's hard at the same time. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Let me ask you, is God's love made complete in you? That's a pretty big question, isn't it? Right. Is God's love made complete in you? This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges or confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus, and there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love.
is God's love made complete in me. Verse 19, we love because he loved, he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates, a, what is this? It's a text. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Love. God, John takes us all through this discourse from Antichrist. And he goes in and he tells us we've got to test the spirits. And now he brings us to the major point of what he's going to show us is going to be the test of our life. And the test of our life is do we love like God has taught us and is God's love made complete in our lives. I'll close with this. I'll jump over. I was walking out of the hospital today and I'm walking up through that parking lot parking deck and I was thinking if there is a true there must be a false mm -hmm. would you agree with that Amen. Mm -hmm. if there is true love there must be false love so as I'm walking up through the parking deck, and I had to start writing this down, the love of God, the love of God. Are we calling the love of the world the love of God? Are we mistaking the love of the world for the love of God? If we are, it's false teaching that we're believing. The world is teaching something. A lot of spirits. And are, so are we believing that the message of love that we're taught in the world, are we, are we, are we mistaken? Or have we missed the question? Are we mistaking the love of the world, the definition of the love of the world? Thinking it's the love of God? See, the truth is the love of God has high tolerance for pain. God's love is activated through everything, through every situation, especially when it hurts, especially when there's a load, especially when there's a trial. That's why we can't let go of the love of God. But we have to understand what the love of God is. And we have to test ourselves. I was thinking about that old song tonight while we're singing. Every time I do a deed I shouldn't do. Every time I say a word I shouldn't say. Let me take what I do and it brings a blessing too. I just steal away somewhere and pray. Have you ever been under the love test and you failed and you had to steal away and pray? I have. See, when we think about love, most of us think in a natural realm. But the love God speaks of, the love John's talking about is supernatural love. That's right. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in tongues of men and angels and do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong with clanging symbol. I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all mysteries, and have all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm, I'm nothing. Yeah. I give all that I have, possessed all I possess to the poor, give my body to be 
burn hardship and I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Everybody say it. Love is kind. Say it. Love does not end me. It does not boast. Say it. It is not proud. Does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Come on, say it. It's not easily angered. It doesn't keep records of wrong. Does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the, the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevered. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there's tongues, they will be still. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. We know in part, we prophesy in part. But when the completeness comes, are you complete in the love of God? What is important disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, that means when I came complete. I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall be full, known fully even as I'm fully known. And these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. What kind of love? Not the love the world teaches. You're nice to me. I'm nice to you. That's, that's what I'm afraid we've mistaken. World love for God's love. Natural love when we're looking into supernatural love. This love doesn't come easy. Am I complete in love? It seems the simplest of messages, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem simple? And then your wife says something. Let me look at somebody who quit church over this. <laughs> who won't quit church over this? Raise right your hand. Then your wife says something. And you didn't know you could get that man that quick. Is the love of God complete? Simple message. Oh, that's just so simple. I just almost got my Corinthians 13. I just almost, you know, I could summarize that pretty easy. And then you start asking me questions about my response of my life. And I go, oh, no. And I remember, you know, come on, guys. Women, you can feel free to nod as well. Then, then I remember I'm not complete. And I have mistaken world love for God's love. They take him innocently. They lead him away. He lets them he doesn't say anything. Love doesn't say it. When you're being persecuted. This is a love test. Don't raise your hand if you've got some ground to make up. I'm going to keep mine down too. But there's a lot of false teaching going on. There's a lot of Christian people don't want to believe about what God's love is about. They slap him, beat his back, press a crown of thorns into his head. They curse him. Unrecognizable torture. I know we're in a hurry. I mean, we got to get to work. And, but let me tell you, if we don't get a grip on love, we say we know him, 
John says, the only way you know him is that his love is complete in you. So he puts that cross on his back and he starts walking. It's a love test. You know what kind of power he has to change the situation? Do you know if we had the power to change situations, you know what we'd do? We'd change it. Why? Because we and only have natural love, not supernatural love. Supernatural love. Drags that cross so far that then he falls under it. The man helps him get it all the way with John the Gospel. Lays down on that and they start driving the spikes in his hand. Do you know what happens when we feel pain? We want to help it, don't we? Huh? They nail him to that tree and drop him down in that hole. And he's hanging there. And it's not the nails that are holding him to the cross, it's his love. This has been a challenge for me in my living to get it. This is what holds him on there. He could have called, the other song says, 10,000 angels. But he, he stays there. Because the love of God is perfected in him. Love test. For, forgive me, Lord, for believing that the world's love is yours. Because the world doesn't know your love. Stand up and please.